uh, I propose you uh, a hard work along uh, all the, the mining chain uh, from uh, uh, exploration to production uh, and all the problem I try to solve by different methods. Uh, normally it's a much longer talk that lasts two hours so I will just uh, mention some points and uh, detail two important points I think which is uh, how can we do what is important in mining the block modeling that is trying to estimate the grade while accounting for the, the geological particularities, the geological units. And the second point will be uh, about geotechnique because uh, geotechnique, uh, not a lot of work has been done in geostatistics for geotechnique. And uh, here you may have some few things which interest you. So, about the unit simulation, it is important, as you may know, uh, to plot the different geological units for different purposes. One purpose uh, being uh, that uh, each geological unit is associated perhaps sometimes to a given a range of grade, some characteristic which has an impact on the way uh, to, to get them. And this is the reason why uh, we need to know if we have enough information to plot well these units. And to know if we have enough information, one method consists uh, on using geostatistical simulation. Uh, geostatistical simulation uh, giving uh, some possible view uh, of the deposit given the data at your disposal. And uh, the first work I did uh, for Codelco uh, um, uh, 15 years ago was to use a typical uh, method uh, made for the petroleum industry uh, for the porphyry copper deposit. And uh, it works uh, not bad at all. I will not detail any more, but if you have questions, I can give. Just to tell you the first work that has been done. And uh, just a, a remark, you have here this picture. Uh, this method uh, were done for horizontal sedimentary deposit. And uh, to apply it uh, in the case of porphyry copper deposit, we just have to turn uh, the problem by 90 degrees on the left or on the right. So sometimes the science is very simple. Another point which concerns also the unit and push uh, the geostatistic in, into its limit was this one. As perhaps you know, uh, El Teniente mine is built around a, a, a waste dike, a sort of inverted cone, the surface from which constitutes the internal surface of the mine. And the, the deal here was to estimate the surface, given what sort of information, just a set of one, indicating that you are inside the dike, and a set of zero, that you are outside. And they were given by an important amount of drill hole. And I see here Frankie, who also worked on the subject and proposed, hello. So this is not uh, normally uh, possible with geostatistics. Why? Because uh, geostatistics requires always some hypothesis of stationarity. And what is stationarity? For the grade, for example, it is that all the grades uh, have the same behavior in many places. And when uh, we do not have this property of stationarity, we try to assess to it by using techniques called like uh, universal Kriging, intrinsic random function of the K, and so on. But here, uh, it seems to be completely impossible to do geostat because what you have is just a set of one, few one, in the middle of infinity of zero. 
And the normally, we can't do geostat with this because it's impossible to get any uh, stationarity. But it was possible to do s few things. Uh, I must mention that uh, each of the points I show you, there is a paper published that you, you can access uh, by internet easily by using my name and uh, with uh, the, the title, for example, LTNT and so on, you access to, 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 um, to a paper which describes in detail. And this was presented at uh, an EIMG two years ago at Freiburg in, in Germany. We arrive here to the point that I am going to detail, which consists on trying to model uh, the deposit, so you know in mine it's usual to divide the deposit into blocks and to try to, act, to give to each block a valuation uh, which is uh, the grade or the recovery ratio and so on. And sometimes the geological unit, it is a case in porphyry copper deposit, have a particularity according to the range of grades they contain and the special behavior of the grade, uh, measured by the function that perhaps you know, which is the variogram function. And uh, this is the reason why the, the people try uh, in the mine, it's very uh, usual practice, uh, to design first the shape of the object. For example, in case of porphyry, you have here in red a breccia, which is contained a rich copper. This is done by the geologist uh, using uh, now uh, software like Leapfrog or Over One. Then uh, what they do is they do an intersection of uh, this object with a grid, a 3D grid defined in order to get a sort of uh, uh, graphic uh, intersection to assess to a percentage. And they say this block contains a given percentage of this unit. Then they do a geostatistical estimation of the grade by using just the the grade uh, associated to such units, and they obtain uh, the block model. And uh, observing this uh, method, proceed from uh, an arbitrary choice that was the grade are independent from the shape of the geological unit. But because there is a sequence, first the shape of the unit, secondly the grade inside. But the first point, which uh, perhaps is not true, because perhaps there is a dependency between the shape of the units and the behavior of the grade. So, first point, perhaps it could be useful to verify this property. Second point is that there is a, a chaining of estimation. That is, we estimate proportion, then we estimate a grade, we multiply both, we do it for all the units, we do the sum, and we obtain the resultant grade. And the problem is that, mathematically speaking, uh, the optimality of a sum of estimate is not the sum of optimal estimate. So, first of all, this procedure is perhaps not optimal. Second, each term of the sum is a product. And a product of estimate, and again, optimality of a product of estimate is not the product of optimal. What do you mean by optimal? I mean by optimal, the, the best estimate you can obtain, given the data, and given the, the fact that we quantify the quality of estimation by a variance between the truth, which is unknown, and what you search. It is what I mean by optimal. And this procedure is not optimal because it changes a uh, few things. So, let's look at, at the way the problem has been modeled. It's, in fact, very simple. You have a given amount of unit, and for this in Geostat, we use what is called indicator function, which is just a function putting one where this unit is here in the 3D space, or zero if it is not. 
And then we do a special codification of the unit. And if we have 10 units, we have 10 such special functions. And then we have a grade. And what do we do when we practice special statistics and when we want to use uh, to study the behavior, the mutual behavior of two special variables, we study the product. And it's the aim of what we call is a covariance, special covariance function of or cross variogram. So here it is very simple. If we want to study the behavior of the grade together with the, the shape given by indicator function, what do we have to do? We just have to, to study the product between the grade and indicator of the unit. And we introduce by this way a concept which is called the partial grade. And this approach, I must mention, is very general. When you have a, along the space a continuous variable and you want to study it together with a categorical variable, because a unit is a categorical variable, study the product and use this concept, if you want, of partial grade. And you have a very nice property, which is fundamental for this approach, that is, at each point, when you do the sum of the indicator function, you just have one. Why? Because at each point where you have a measurement, uh, the measurement has been labeled one time for a given unit. So if you have one for the unit, for example, one, it must be zero to the other one. And by this way, you see that when you, the total grade you have at any location x in the 3D space can be expressed as just a simple sum of the partial grades. And this is good because as at each point where you have a measurement, you have all the partial grades which are defined, you have a very nice property, which is the optimality of the sum is the sum of optimal estimation. And you see here COK to mention that the method used in Geostat for this is called Cochrigging. I know that not everybody here knows Geostat, so I will not use uh, too much concept of Geostat, but just uh, know that Cochrigging is uh, estimating few variables together by a method called Krigging, and Krigging everybody knows, I think. So, first of all, we have obtained here, just by looking at the problem, a method which ensures us the optimality. And in practice, it is very simple. Uh, you have many sample, samples all over the domain. Each sample is labeled by a, a unit, a, a number between 1 and 10, for example, if you have 10 units. So you just have to build 10 special functions associated to the 10 unit. You multiply by the, by the grade, and you do a co rigging of this. Now, the second challenge is this is perhaps a little bit complicated doing this. Is it possible to simplify? And here come what is the best from my point of view in Geostat, which is not uh, the, really the method at the end that you will use, but the analyze, which conducts you to a given method. And here, the analyze shows us a nice property that I am going to, un to indicate, and it concerns uh, all the porphyry copper of uh, the Codelco, the, the 10 I studied. So you have, but before perhaps uh, some uh, recall, theoretical recall, that is, so you have n function, special function called partial grades. You have n unit indicator. Uh, just uh, remember what I told you about the Eltoniente dike. Uh, one when you are inside, zero when you are outside. So indicator represents the geometry of the problem. And partial grade, the metal and the economy of the problem. And given this, you have very nice properties, which are not so, so well known, 
but which came here immediately by putting the problem as it was after introduction of partial grade. You know perhaps the variogram, but what is interesting is not uh, only uh, studying direct variogram and cross variogram, but to do ratio of variogram. And what is nice is that when you do a cross variogram between two indicator functions divided by a variogram of one indicator function, you have a probabilistic interpretation, and it is what? It is that by this way you can calculate the probability to go inside a unit J when you know that you are in the unit I. And this is very important because by this way, as the function, space function H, which is the distance between the two points, increase, you can see the way, the way you go from a given unit to another one. And what do you do by this way? You quantify the transition because some unit can be hard, some unit can be very well mixed and a very small trans transition. And this is the function that measures the transition between the unit and designs the shapes of the unit. The reason why a uh, uh, category of people um, which work more with uh, um, with the random process, more than geostat, call this function, this ratio, a transiogram, because it measures transition. This is the first point about the geometry. A second one is that this time, when you take indicator function and you calculate the cross variogram together with the partial grade and you divide by a single variogram, this time you obtain the mathematical, the behavior of the grade when you go inside the unit. And this is important because this uh, condition, uh, eventually you measure by this way, if when you go in the, uh, inside deep the unit, there could be enrichment or impoverishment of the grade. And this quantifies the dependency of the grade to the shape. Remember, when I told you that there is a separation in the usual practice of the people, that is, first, I design my unit, secondly, I calculate the grade inside, there is an implicit uh, uh, hypothesis, which is the shape and the grade are not linked. By this function, you measure this link. And the nice property that we found uh, for the porphyry copper deposit and it's true for Shukikamata Open Pit, Shukikamata Underground Project, uh, Mansamina and Radomir Atomic, uh, all the, the, the behavior of the grade do not depend on the shape of the unit. And therefore, you have a nice property that is the grade, the partial grade, can be expressed as a linear function of the indicator plus a residual, which simplifies a lot the system. And by this way, we found a way to simulate the porphyry de 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 deposit in Chile, that is, first, you simulate the units, and I told you the first point I presented you, we can use uh, petroleum techniques called truncated Gaussian simulation for this purpose. Then for each unit, you affect, you associate a fixed average, which is the average of the grade for this type of unit. You add to this a, re a random uh, residual, the, uh, the variance from which you can measure experimentally, and you obtain a way to reproduce uh, geostatistical simulation of porphyry copper deposit because of this nice property. A nice property which shows that finally the practice of the geologist is not so bad because by intuition they did the separation and they proceed by this way. But the only small mistake they made was the sequence of estimation which was not uh, the good one. And uh, just a, a remark, what I feel which is nice in the in the job of geostatistician is that we are linked to many domains. I have been working in petroleum, in marine geophysics, in mine, 
uh, with hydrogeologists actually, and uh, uh, it is to observe the practice to, to, to try to enter into um, empathy with a, with a new domain, and finally we receive uh, as many as we give. And it's sometimes uh, it's just. Uh, the, the question is not, well, uh, I try to find you a solution. Sometimes it is, why does it work? Because if you know why it works, you can perhaps uh, know uh, when it will not work and perhaps also improve a little bit. And this is the case here. Okay. So that's a lot of uh, blah, blah, mathematic blah, blah. Now, what about the result? That is, uh, all is all this uh, efficient, okay, partial grade, transition gram, uh, but does it work? And uh, for Radomir Atomic, we had uh, uh, the opportunity to know the value of the block or to know something very close to the value of the block that was um, given by blast all. Very numerous, and therefore, we assess to a very good uh, estimation of the value of the grade at a scale of, uh, of the room, uh, given uh, some uh, local information uh, like this, at the scale of small sample. So we are, we are able to compare to what is called the truth, which uh, appears horizontally in this uh, scatter diagram. Here, vertically, you have the grade of the blocks. So we did, uh, we took uh, all the deposit for each block uh, uh, size, perhaps 15 by 10 by 10 meters. We estimate uh, the grade by different methods. Here, we estimate by, that was a geologist, drawing, intersection, the, the procedure I described you. This is the, 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 the method, oh, pardon. Voilà. The method I presented you, vertically, here and here, you have what is considered as a truth. And when we compare the geological approach to uh, the geostatistical one, we, you see that we have a slight improvement in terms of correlation coefficient. So first of all, it is not important difference, okay? It's from 0 0.63 to 0 0.69. But it took to me three weeks to do this. It took to two geologists one year and five to do this. But the most in interesting uh, scatter diagram is this one. Because you see that between the both methods, you have also a correlation coefficient, which is not so important. And what does it mean? It means that the truth is not this one. It's not the, the geostatistician, the stupid geostatistician who, who doesn't know anything in geologist. It is not the geologist neither. It is between. And then the consequence is that instead of trying to replace a practice by another one, I, I, I propose to do both. And by doing both, it is, uh, as uh, the geostatistical approach is very quick, do it, do the traditional approach because uh, 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 including the geological knowledge inside uh, the model is very important too and difficult to quantify mathematically. And then adapt your classification uh, by the fact that there is a convergence between the method or not. You know that in the mind, perhaps, uh, you classify your resource. That is, you not only estimate the value of the grade at, at the scale of a block, but also you say, here, I have a good estimation. Why? Because I have many exploratory samples around. Here, it's a bad. So to add to this, another concept, which is, well, here, the both method give very approximate value. I am inside uh, this domain. And therefore, I say it's coherent, so it's well estimated and coherent. And when it's aside, you say, well, why, where is the difference? 
The difference is that, in one hand, the, the shape of the unit has been designed by just a pure mathematical uh, co-creating of indicators, so an estimate, a blind, blind to any knowledge of geological, and uh, the difference is due by the geologist who did it by hand. So, this is, when it's outside, it is geological inferred. Perhaps it's uh, justified, perhaps not, but you can write it. That was for the, the, the part of, of the I, I wanted to detail. Ah, ça veut pas bouger. Voilà. So that was for so block modeling. Now I will um, mention uh, um, another thing that is uh, concerning the blast hole and the drill hole. That's a problem uh, important too. Uh, that is, uh, when you go from the phases, uh, the step which is exploration, you have done your block model and you are entering into production, you have new data called uh, blast hole, uh, which uh, have uh, some particularities. The sampling process is not the same. Um, the quality, we don't know and the support, because uh, Geostat deals a lot with the support. That is, uh, you know an information, an information represents an average of a, what we call a support, so it's a given volume. As you increase the volume, uh, you decrease the variability, that is, uh, and we have here a problem because the idea The idea uh, is uh, how can I use both information to estimate the value of a block in order to estimate the next days of production. Because you blast immediately. When you blast, then you, you take the material and you continue. So the blast, you have it uh, uh, today. Tomorrow you, you did not blast. Can I mix both information? Uh, the blast I have here, here I have some drill hole. Is it possible to use both information in order to estimate the blocks I, I will mine tomorrow and the day after? But the difficulty is that how can I account for the support? And the work done here uh, was based uh, on a part uh, of... Uh, a deposit, uh, probably radomirotomic, uh, where I had both information. I had a, 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 a procedure which consists on calculating a variogram, verifying if it respects the rule of the convolution, of the regularization. And I obtained a, a good model at the end, uh, which shows me uh, that uh, the blast uh, all contain an error, a, a measurement error, but the drill too, both errors are not uh, linked, statistically linked, and by this way I become able to do very nice things that I will not detail, like uh, the first one for example, I have a measurement, I know that there, there is an error, due to the, to the pro sampling procedure, and I can estimate the error and uh, remove it. I can clean my sample. <laughs> the second thing is important, and again, it is uh, the use of a technique I developed a long time ago for the petroleum industry. Uh, that was a scanner image uh, due to X-ray, uh, the, the detail of the image were not good because the pixels were too big and with Geostat I was able to, to depixelize, that is, to increase the, sp the resolution of the image. So to, to get more detail. And here, the blast you can do, that is, given a blast which is an average of uh, 15 meters and you have many sample uh, such blast hole, you can estimate a point value, infinity small value, so that the map you, you, you plot 
has more detail than the one you should have with just using blast all. So you get, can get detail. Uh, for, you know sometimes on TV when they hide the face of, of the person by, by rectangular, okay? So this is exactly the problem. You have an average uh, of the color over a rectangle which moves with the face to hide it, right? Then you can use your stat to, 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 to give a, an idea of, of uh, the face of the person. And obviously, uh, I did uh, a model able to mix both information in a single system so that the people at the production can uh, use uh, the information. Because there is a, uh, a big problem. It is the following. The people of production do not use the, the real information. They just use the blast hole to estimate locally. And uh, to do this, uh, you can uh, just uh, do it when you have blast. When you are going to blast, the idea should be, well, can I extrapolate what could be the value of uh, the grade here, knowing the value uh, of the grade given by the blast here. But here I have just some drill hole information. If you don't use the drill hole information, what you do is called extrapolation. And extrapolation is very dangerous, especially if you are not uh, in a strict stationarity framework. Then, if you do use together drill, blast, and some drill, even if they are not numerous, you completely um, strangle uh, the, the extrapolation to something which stays realistic. So it's very important to be able to use such system. Uh, I continue, if it won't. No. Yes, okay. So that's um, another important point that I will detail. It concerns geotechnique. So you know we are, we are traveling, walking uh, along the mining chain. We have been designing uh, geological objects trying to, to, to calculate uh, the best we can uh, the value of the grade at the scale of a block. Then uh, we have seen how to mix information of different quality uh, known representing different volumes. And now we arrive, we are going to mine, we are going to underground tunnels, and uh, they must not break. Safety is very important, as you know, in the mining. And for this, uh, geotechnique is very important, and we have to study, uh, we have to study uh, uh, geotechnical parameters, one being fracture frequency. Fracture frequency, you have also rock quality designation, and uh, fracture frequency in Shukikamata and Radomir Atomic cause a problem because when you extract a sample, when you uh, number the number of uh, fractures that you have, because what is fracture frequency? It is the number of fractures you have, you count, uh, divided by the length of the sample. And the, the definition of fracture frequency. And the idea is that if I have uh, important fracture frequency, uh, it's a dangerous uh, uh, rock, uh, so, uh, I must reinforce uh, the, the tunnel. But there is a problem that, that is in the northern Chile, the, the rock sometimes is not lose his uh, coherency, it is crushed. So that finally you cannot use all the lengths of uh, the rock uh, to, to, to measure, to calculate the number of fractures. And that's a real problem, because even if, and it's necessary, the sample have the same size, otherwise you cannot compare a sample to another one and you cannot uh, specialize the problem. The problem is that it makes this quantity, it loses a property which is important in geostat, called additivity. What is additivity? It is, I have a, a, a quantity here, a quantity here, a quantity here. I can do an average. It has a sense. 
You cannot do this for, for any variable. F for example, a rate, a recovery, for example, we will see it later, a recovery is not additive. Why? What is a recovery ratio in mine? It is the ratio of the quantity of metal you recover uh, by a process divided by the in situ metal. When you move in 3D uh, along the space, from a location to another one, you not only have the numerator who change, that is you recover good or not here, but also the in situ grade change, so that the ratio ch change. And you can have at two, 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 two places, you can have the same ratio, but with very different numerator and denominator. It is not additive. The color is not additive, neither. Uh, you have 50% uh, uh, of uh, white and 50% of black, when you mix the color, do not give you intermediate gray. What happens is that with 99% of white and just 1% of uh, black, when you mix, you already have a, a, a gray very dark. So the, the permeability is not uh, additive neither. And here, because a part of the sample, in our case, 1.5 meter, uh, because the part is crushed, uh, you have to divide the number of fractures by something which change along the space. And this is really a problem. So the first uh, work I did on the subject is to get uh, the, the possibility to, to get uh, that's the explanation of the additivity. Uh, the first work I did was to find a method to estimate this quantity uh, by uh, combining the estimating the numerator and the denominator. But it's not the point I want to focus on. It's most interesting is following. The question is, is there, we observe the sample. And what do we see? Here you have a f first sample. And you see that uh, you have one fracture and just 11 centimeters of crushing. We observe another one, and we see that we have a lot of fracture and a crush length very important. So we say, well, uh, a crushing is a result uh, of fracturing. When fractures are numerous, we have a lot of crushing because uh, it's a material uh, which has a, a low strength. Okay, perhaps, perhaps, let's look at this on the first uh, da data set. Look at the scatter diagram between the crush length and the number of fractures. So I recall uh, all my samples have the same size, which is 1.5 meters. And I see a horrible scatter diagram. Yes, I have a very good uh, linear correlation coefficient. We could say that, uh, yes, when you, the, the crush length increase, a lot of part of the sample uh, lose it, its integrity, and I have an important number of fractures. Okay? But this is not the nice uh, scatter diagram we want to see when we want to model the things by linear regression, for example. Because you have here uh, part of, of the scatter diagram which show uh, some independency. How many minutes do I have more? It's okay? Yeah. A quarter? Five, ten. Five, ten? Great. So, um, so it's not nice, but there is a linear correlation. So, Oh, yes, I, I don't, uh, this I must not, I forget this. Okay, I go far. Ah. Okay. And the question I asked me was the following. Perhaps 
a contribution to, to, the, to, the, to the crushing could be that the fracture could cross themselves. When the fracture cross themselves, they could generate crushing. When they tend to be parallel to themselves, they could not generate crushing. So I needed, um, I needed a measurement of the tendency for the fracture to be parallel to himself or to cross to himself. And it was possible to create a such, uh, I will describe you now, because each fracture is not only counted, we also classify the fracture by saying that it belongs to an interval of, uh, from the sample between zero and uh, uh, 30 degrees, uh, or you have second class, three class of fracture. And so I got the, the way to measure eventually the way the fracture do or do not cross themselves. So I do not present you necessarily the formula. It's a sort of uh, variance that I create, but in the angular domain. And I produce by this way something which is called the directional concentration, which uh, is an attribute which goes from zero to one. When it is one, it means that all the fractures are parallel, or more precisely, they belong to the same angular class. When it is zero, I have what is called full directional isotropy, that is, the fractures are equally uh, on the three sets of classification at our disposal. And when I produce this attribute and when I map it, I already observed something interesting. That was, we are here, what is called the, MM, the West Fault, which is a, a region well damaged. And we see that when uh, we go from the West Fault, uh, far from the West Fault to the east, we discover that the fractures tend mainly to be parallel to themselves and not to cramp themselves. While in the zone, in a domain which is well damaged, they tend to cross themselves. So this is the first indication that what I produce, the directional concentration, is not completely stupid. The second point was uh, this one, that is, among uh, all the samples at my disposal, I took the one having a concentration, directional concentration belonging to this interval. That is, fracture tending to cross themselves a lot. And what do I observe when I do the scatter diagram between the crush lens and the number of fractures? I have a nice scatter diagram with important correlation. And as, in average, the fracture tends to be parallel to themselves, you see that the correlation is uh, destroyed. So I found here um, an attribute, which is uh, as the number of fractures and as the crush length, which is uh, what we call in Geostat a regionalized variable, that you can produce uh, for each sample and which explain the link between fracturing and crunching. When the fractures tend to cross themselves, they produce crushing. When the fractures do not tend to cross, cross themselves, they don't produce crushing. It doesn't mean that you don't have crushing. It means that the crushing is an intrinsic property of the rock. And that's important because the people of geotechnique never consider crushing as an intrinsic property of the rock. And that's important to, to, to know this because before uh, doing such a calculation for the people, crushing was just annoying themselves because they were unable to count the fracture. Now they found a new attribute characteristic of the rock. And by this way, I was able 
to and that's uh, uh, another case study which shows also that when the fracture tends to cram themselves you have important correlation and when uh, as the tendency to cross themselves decrease the correlation uh, disappears that's uh, the point so you have here something very marvelous for a geostatistician you have a correlation coefficient between two variables which depends on another variable which is regionalized in the space. So what do we have? We get the ability to express a correlation coefficient between two spatialized variables as a function of a third one. And we obtain another, another spatial variable called the correlation between both measurements. So, you will have an important amount of sample. At each sample, we measure the crush length. We count the number of fractures. We calculate the, the directional concentration. And we become able to deduce a potential coefficient of correlation. That's marvelous, because by this way, you can go one step more, which is... We forget this formula. <laughs> it's not the moment to present it after a good lunch. Okay. It is that um, by using what you call, we call a residual model, we can calculate local anomalies. That is, you have three variables of interest for each sample. You have the number of fractures, you have um, the crush length, you have the directional concentration from which you deduce a correlation coefficient. And this correlation coefficient helps you to, to predict the number of fractures you should have given the three variables. Given this correlation coefficient, as you have a linear correlation, you can deduce the number of fractures you could expect given the three attributes you have here locally. But you measure more or less. So when you compare what you should expect to what you measure, you introduce the concept of independent fracture number, which is a number which is positive or negative, which says to you, here, I have less fracture than I should have, and here, I have more fracture than I should have. And this is very important because, again, when I plot this attribute in the space, I see that in this domain, I have much more fracture than I should have, while here, in this domain, I have much less. Okay, nice, but how is it useful? It is useful because you, instead of plotting the fracture frequency, which is something, finally, which is a sort of ratio between a number of fractures and something which is not crushed, separate. Don't do this. Do the calculation. The fracture frequency here tells you that nothing is different in any place uh, of, of the domain, while if you plot the domain where you have more fracture than you could expect, you detect a sort of frontier here which tells you, take care, because here it is a worse quality than here. So instead, if you have a tunnel which cross this domain, take care because here you are going to encounter important difference in the, in the rock strength. And you can perhaps gain uh, some material here that you put to reinforce this part here. And uh, as my